Thank you. Great, nice. Yeah. For the Verizon, September 12, uh, 2023, uh, the PCE Audit Finance Committee. I think we have a quorum, but just to start off, one. And you can talk about any special things we have going on today with people participating via Zoom or anything like that. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, Burlingame? Yes, don't. East Palo Alto? Um, so, Amy, would you like right now just a um, 
an approval? No, we didn't make this an uh, action yeah. item okay. or discussion. Okay. It was just more of a discuss, uh, okay. kind of an, it was more of an FYI the way we set this up because we thought of it later. Yeah, and I didn't I mean, realize it. Happened. Is there a particular reason that it needs to be a board approval as opposed to just a report? It's um, the, the uh, Mike Maher's recommendation is that what the board is approving tell is uh, is um, outflow of expenses and outflow of cash. And when staff does something that's not board approved, that okay, the board should the, audit, yeah, yeah. Okay, the right. board should you know um, yeah officially say that they know this and and they're aware, they're aware of it. They approve it. So got it. Um, it's kind of belt and suspenders in my opinion, but. Um, I, you know, it's not a big deal to do so, but okay. we can't really do it until audited and then it got, it didn't happen last year yeah. um, when, in the fall. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, um, now this is a uh, resolution for this committee um, and what we've done in the past is that this committee then um, recommends the board approve um, the total operating expenses. These, this has been updated for um, uh, April financials, which were not part of last month, and then one change um, to the uh, program's budget as well, um, and then some calculation issues, but not change in, in spending. Um, but we are asking at the end of this presentation to for this committee to uh, approve a resolution recommending board for a board approval. Okay, next slide. Um, again, this is just a Schedule what we've done, um, review uh, we did those other two with the board and its committee. Um, we're doing the June 12th today. We'll review this uh, shorter version of these slides with the executive committee in an hour and a half. Um, and then the board approves the, hopefully approves the financial final budget on June 22nd. Next slide, please. Um, and I mentioned already there were some minor ch changes um, update to year end forecast reflecting April 2023 financials, minor adjustments to the program budget. Um, we made some modifications to the assumptions of uh, PB long term prepayment for conservatism. Um, doesn't really affect this current year's budget, but it does affect the five year plan. Um, and we made some minor modifications to correct the base cash on hand calculation, but you'll see the effect of that uh, in a minute. Uh, next, any questions? Okay. Uh, next slide is, um, I won't go through this unless you want me to, but this is just a reiteration of the key assumptions. Um, uh, and ne next slide, again, again, this is also just a reiteration of the same, uh, the same assumptions we made last time. Um, just noting in particular, the two conservatism contingencies, uh, energy cost volatility of $15 million a year, um, by the way, we did that last year and we used it all. Um, uh, we're going to be very close to the overall spending um, because some other categories are, are below spend uh, budget, um, but the energy um, costs will likely be a few million dollars above the budget, even with that $15 million contingency. So it so, um, just reflects the um, the inability to forecast and, and uh, volatility that is unplanable. Un, uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, Andy, can you go back? To sure. Really quick? Can you remind me the 99% of 24 7 power we renewable project delays equals 56 million yep. five years? Sure. So, what we, what we, um, the five year plan assumes that we're going to um, um, sign. I think it's, I don't have it on this slide, but I think it's 13 to 15 contracts um, that are necessary between now and that date in order to meet that, um, the target of the 99% 24 by seven hourly um, renewable by 2027. Um, we, the, the, there is obviously some risk in, in signing contracts, some take longer, some go away, um, uh, some end up being negotiated at a price that we don't, uh, that what we couldn't expect at this point. So we've got a lot of assumptions in the budget. Um, and if we don't um, sign all those contracts, there's um, potential, uh, we'd have to buy renewable energy at market prices. 
Um, and our estimate is that that's about $112 million more than if we signed those 13 to 15 contracts. I can't remember the number. Um, and so what we've done is assume for the five-year plan that we will sign half of those. Um, and therefore we built in $56 million of contingency into the five-year plan for the fact that some of those projects might not get signed. Um, it has very little impact on the current year's budget. That's only 770,000 um, into the current fiscal year budget that we're approving here. So in the, in, so there's um, the $15 million of, of contingency plus $770,000 of contingency built in for the fact that we would, or the possibility that we wouldn't be able to sign contracts all. And then the odds are that we're not gonna sign all every contract as as we planned out for five years on the date that we've assumed and the price was assumed and mm -hmm. uh, there's lots of things that could happen. Jan, maybe I can go ahead. So we're, we're, we are receiving a reality shot right now and a year from now we're gonna know different, right? So this year, 770,000, okay. And then we'll be able to make a bigger decision well, we'll know um, some of those contracts are signed in, in this year, and some of the next year, and some of the following year. And every year, we're going to know more right. about where we are or the likelihood of signing the, the next right. year's contract. So we'll, we'll be able to refine that $56 million contingency um, as we get closer to those dates. And we try to predict out three or four or five years out about what we're going to sign contracts for is, is yeah. you know, is tough. Can I, may I ask them too, just on that, is the $56 million, would, would that number still be in the budget if we weren't doing the 24-7? No, the 24-7 is less expensive. So this is contingency that if we are not able to sign the contracts and get those projects online in the time that we would like, it will cost us more because we'll have to go out to the market and buy recs and things like that to cover the renewables. So the 24 seven is less expensive. This is if we, if we aren't able to get the projects going in the time that we want, it'll cost us a little bit more. The renewables are less expensive than other resources. So, and just based on our predictions of what you know, our forecast of what market prices are going to be, what it's going to cost in the market if we were to have to buy, you know, brown power and add rex to it or whatever, that's, then it would cost us more. And buy more RA and more rex and yeah. all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cost more. Nice. If we're not able to sign the contracts on the pace and, so and the price the question becomes, more. you're saying, I understand it's cheaper, but if we weren't targeting 20% and we were just buying for procurement for the holistic portfolio, would we be budgeting this particular time? So this this is for us to be 100% renewable by 2025. Because right now we're 50% renewable, 50% clean. Okay. So we're still aiming towards the 100% renewable by 2025. Okay. It's just the 24/7. We're going to talk about this at the executive committee. We're asking to delay that for two years because indeed projects are starting later. One of the key projects that we trying to get online their two years being mm -hmm. so okay. I just I just wanted I I wanted to just make sure everybody understood that line in there is it the big number 56 million is so well, over five years so it's like 10 million a year but it's still a big it's a big number yes there are other big numbers that are going on in yeah here. so it's not necessarily when you look at a billion million dollar power budget it's a small percentage of the overall power budget. Yeah, it's five around five percent or so a year um, out of the three hundred million dollar power budget. Um, but um, and, and, and and we don't we this says from Marty's question if this will be refined as we get closer yeah. and yeah. and and or we there's you know different assumptions made about the timing of the twenty four seven or the achievement of twenty four seven. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else have a question or any members of them? And as Sean just noted, it's a contingency. So it's not like we're planning to spend it. Right. Like if we were to, you know, we, we might spend $10 million in one day if we have a super hot day. So, right. you know, but things yeah, happen. That's really important yeah. when we're thinking about our uh, retained earnings and yeah. the cash that we're going to have in the bank and 
what we're doing with all that, the volatility around this is so quickly changeable and meaningful that, you know, in order to continue to make sure the operating um, efficiency of the business and the business can operate actually profitably because we don't have a stop like travel markets where we can like necessarily issue bonds, but we don't really want to, so or equity. So maintaining our operations has to be Okay. Um, I'm gonna, the next slide is a lot of detail, which I'm going to skip over um, and just go too far, two slides forward for a summary slide, or at least more summarized. Um, this is a, a, the left column is the draft budget. Um, and then this is the full five year, total five year plan. Um, the left column of Revised draft budget or revised from the last meeting um, shows the change in that position budget of $124.6 million positive. Um, the total operating expenses of $350.6 million is in that pink peach colored uh, highlighted. Um, that's the number that we're asking the board to approve um, is total operating expenses. And we are proposed, our budget shows uh, ending unrestricted days cash on hand at the end of 2024, 393. Um, and then the five-year outlook um, shows us getting to 464 days cash on hand in, 20, in June of 2028. Um, there is a reduction or expected reduction in 2025 um, on the days cash on hand from 393 to 326. Um, two, two things are going on there. One, operating expenses are higher and therefore there's more um, days. Uh, it's easier to get to days and there are fewer days for the same amount of cash. And second, that's the year when we start spending a significant amount of money for the gov PD programs before we start to recover that in the following uh, two years after that. I know, I know it's small. I don't know how to make it any bigger than that's better there. Okay. Yeah. What are the um, well, let Sean, why don't you answer the question? That'll go PD for All right. <laughs> so I'm still here. I'll be happy to try. I'm still here till uh, today. 18 more days. Yeah. Um, uh, the Gov PV is the solar plus storage on public buildings. I, I do know. I do know. Yeah, we're, we're owning. So we're just not all the. Yeah, no, 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 no. But maybe, maybe you could just remind folks to put it why it is where it is. Um, and it happens. Oh, yeah. So um, that was in the assumptions a little back, farther back. But we made the assumption that, if I go back uh, three slides, right there. Um, about three quarters of the way down, capital outlay and investment tax credit. So the PV1 program is a smaller version. Um, we've assumed that the $7.4 million outflow will be a capital outflow and not an expense. So it's not showing up in the expense line items. Um, and then we've assumed about 30%, it's not exact, but it's roughly 30% on both of them, a $2.2 million investment tax credit inflow uh, two years after the expense. Same thing for the larger program uh, that starts in 2025. Um, we've assumed uh, that that was the one I was talking about for $43 million. Um, and we would assume we're assuming $15 million again, which is about 30% roughly um, two years after that. So a big, a big drawdown from a cash standpoint in FY25 for the $43 million bigger um, program. Okay, go back Thank forward you. three slides. Yes. And, and just to add, this, this wasn't showing up before, so we wanted to make sure that you were perfectly aware of what was going on and how this affects the cash. Yeah, so that, that again, it's, a, it's hard to see, but the right, book, right between the two yellow highlighted lines, we've shown total cash before, before the GovPV programs and then the net uh, outflow and inflow from them. Um, so ten and a half million dollars in this current fiscal year, and then forty-six million dollars outflow in 
2025 before things start to come back and that there's offsets of other expenses. So, um, and that the unrestricted days cash on hand is is after those programs. So, and Andy, those we don't have any assumptions of right now. That's just the program as it is in place. So, if it's successful, we want to do more. We don't have anything put in there yet, right? And I also I mentioned for conservatism, we haven't built in the prepayment. The repayment. The, the intention is that. Um, cities or municipalities that we put these on, they're going to pay back mm -hmm. through their electric rates over the over 20 year period. And we haven't built that in yet. Um, so there is some conservatism. It wouldn't affect this current year because there wouldn't be any no. payment now, but and it, and it will affect next year as we refine how it's really going to work. Okay. Um, and next slide, please. If there, unless there are questions, um, let the what we're asking uh, this committee to approve and recommend to the board and the board approve is total operating expenses not to exceed 350.6 million. Um, the, um, the that is uh, just operating expenses. Um, it's not the net position change. So revenues could be uh, above or below the budget, but we're we're basically asking for a authorization to spend. Um, this amount of money. And if you, for those of you who weren't here or may not remember, we used to approve the budget on a line item by line item basis. And that became problematic because some, some were over, some were under. And then even though we were under in total, it didn't really make sense to spend a whole lot more time going back and retroactively approving certain line items. So we came to this conclusion about three years ago. Great. So we'll go ahead and open this up for um, questions or comments. Like if anybody mm -hmm. uh, uh, no. also open it up to members of the public. If anybody has any questions, any members of the public. So hearing none, if anyone would like to make a motion to approve, party, you see them. It's so moved. Second. Second by Jeff Alves. Um, Oh. Okay, so this will be recommending up to executive committee first and then to the full board? Yeah, um, not really, because this committee is a committee of the board. So we're basically, we're just doing an FYI to the executive committee. Okay, just to tell right. them. Right. Um, we're not asking them, the executive committee to approve anything or, or and we haven't in the past. That's fine. In fact, last year, this meeting, that was the executive committee following this resolution approved for recommendation didn't happen, it was canceled, so. Oh yeah, okay. Okay, great, thank you so much. So let's go on to the investment strategy. I never know what to do with my 90, my 92 year old mother-in-law calls. Uh, <laughs> no, that's what it should cause again, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> usually it's, usually what's my bank account balance? Um, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> I never, I never know whether I should ignore it or not. Um, uh, let's see. Um, okay, next next slide, please. Okay, so this, I this we would like some direction. Um, uh, the current estimated summary of our cash is as follows. Uh, this was about a week ago. We have at Fidelity about fifty million dollars in a money market government portfolio. We have um, First Republic Bank sitting in cash. We have Schwab, which is also in a um, basically treasury money fund. Yeah. Uh, and then we have U.S. Bank as custodian for our cap, for assets we hold, um, but the portfolio is split between two investment managers. But we hold those in, in a latter, mostly municipal treasury security type portfolio. Mm -hmm. Two hundred and forty million dollars. And you can see that, for example, the fidelity is about 20% of our portfolio as of June 2nd, which is in a money market government portfolio. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the investment policy we have in place today, policy 19, was adopted on May 28, 2020, um, with three priorities safety, liquidity, and return, but safety is how we monitor it. At the time we adopted this policy, it was to enable broader access to high quality fixed income investment options, 
um, diversify our portfolio and enhance investment returns with safety as the overarching principle. Um, we expanded investment options to a uh, permitted by the California government code to approve, allow a couple, couple of other areas. Um, and we extended the maturity of allowable investments to a two year maximum to a five year maximum. So we had very, we had only very short um, or, uh, maturity at the time. Um, and we eliminated the one year maximum on the weighted average maturity. The code has no limit, but ours, and ours has been running at about two and a half years uh, for the last couple of years. Um, so that's a partly a summary. Keep next page, next slide, please. Um, we, um, as part of that, we added some guardrails of maximum holdings in some specific categories. And a few examples are that we had corporate, we, we had a, minimum, a maximum of up to 30% of our portfolio on medium term notes, up to 20% in money market mutual funds combined, and no more than 10% in a single money market fund. Um, the, the problem with that is that each manager can comply with the policy, but more difficult to monitor overall compliance across institutions because we're not, we're not really adding them all up and figuring out where, where we are, we're, we're asking each manager to do that. Um, and the, um, the simplification and safety directions have led to a violation of, with a quote of money market fund guard, guard groups. Next slide, please. So, and that by the quote violation, Fidelity, for example, and Schwab are both in money market funds that are very safe. Okay, hold on. We understand. Hello. Yes. Sorry, is, is the violation our internal controls or is the violation? Controls is that we we don't allow more than X percent in any one type of uh, investment. So by having these large amounts in Schwab or Fidelity, it exceeds that X percent amount that our policy says that we can have. Yeah, any one policy, type of investment. Yeah, it's not a statement. <laughs> The way these companies have to operate is that, um, like PFM, the money managers, what we didn't want with them to just roll all our money into a money market fund. So usually these people don't have more than the time. The cash position is often held in a stiff update, and then they're actively managing. And so the big issue is. He says, not how to turn it off. Let's keep the fire. Five minutes. Not even. I'm sure the living person that might be able to push the button. I'll I'll do it. Okay. So our alternatives are to remove or relax those money market mutual fund guardrails. Um. We could establish fixed income managed portfolios with Schwab and Fidelity to accomplish the same diversification for each of those accounts that, and, and in fact, Schwab has asked them, us to do that um, and pro proposed that we do that. Um, it hasn't come up with Fidelity, but it would be easy for them to do as well if we wanted to. Um, we could, um, you know, may have direction about specific balances that you want to maintain. For example, we're getting ready to, since the direction was not to keep so much money at First Republic, we're about 25 million now. And I've been thinking about transferring another five or $10 million somewhere. Um, however, I don't want to ex exacerbate the, the, the amount of money at Fidelity and Schwab that are already in quote, unquote violation. Um, and I would like some direction about whether you would would like us to continue to fund the U.S. Bank um, investment management at for PFM and FRB, which are about sixty million dollars each at the moment. So this is a discussion item um, to get some input about direction you would like us to take, and, and if, for example, we want to relax or remove the money or change the money market mutual fund guardrails, then we would come back with a revised policy. So 
I just want to explain why we put the money market mutual fund guardrail in the first place, which is so that if you have money with PF, originally we have money with PFM and FRB only, and then we had the, um, the First Republic Bank operating account. And then we had, I guess, little bits of cash over in the lockbox situation at um, Wilmington. So the idea was if you're paying active management fees of whatever we were paying, eight, 10 basis points, I didn't, we didn't want them to take our money and then just dump it in the mutual fund, which then we would be paying mutual fund fees and active management fees. So we limited it of a mutual fund, not for diversification concerns, because a, a mutual fund is by definition Fully diversified. We limited it because we didn't want to double up on fees um, and have them being lazy and just saying, oh, well, we're not going to actively manage all this. We'll just sort of stick 70% of it in the fund. So that was why the, we have the limit on it of 10%. It's not a concern over diversification. That's not the issue. Because the money market fund, by definition, is highly diversified, more diversified. Than ours. It has to do with double paying fees. So I think that maybe sets it into a different. So, what alternative is to have an invest to expand the investment policy to say, here's how we want our portfolio to be managed by investment managers? Yes. And, but, but the broader portfolio yeah. doesn't, is it limited by that? So, so what you could say is we're going to have, you know, the way we're going to structure this portfolio is we're going to have, um, yeah, we didn't anticipate at the time we would ever have this much cash. That was another part of the issue. It's like we were thinking we were just going to be managing, you know, active cash, and then anything that we swept out, we needed to be managed in a little higher returning situation. So what we could what we could do is we could say um, that you know we we're going to have our operating accounts, and then we will have our actively managed, which are probably the last places. You might pull money. I don't know. You'd have to think about prioritization of how you want to reduce money at the first to balance, rebalance to make sure we're not exceeding anybody holding too much of the portfolio. And then, and then, but but understanding that for those people, we're still going to comply that we don't want any more than ten percent of their funds to be to be managed in a money market because we want them fully invested and paying them for active investment management. And then the fidelity and the Schwab accounts will can, I think it's a cost thing, Andy. How much cheaper is it for them to actively manage it versus for them to manage it in a mutual fund? Yeah, they, they, the, 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 the fees, the built in fees in the mutual fund are like 0.2% or something like that, if I recall. Right. Um, and right now they're earning 5%. So, I mean, it, right now the rates are pretty, pretty high. Yeah. And, um, the, um, but we pay like eight basis points to manage active management. I think it's like eight to 10 basis points, seven, eight, 10 basis, something right. in that range yep. for PFM and First Republic Bank. And they have an actual person sitting there picking stock, picking bonds and moving them around and short. Now Schwab and Fidelity have the same thing. They have a portfolio manager. It's just, it's not a separate account for us. It's a commingled fund where we're invested with lots of other investors. So we share the cost of that. And the only reason we wouldn't want to be in that is if we wanted to put on specific portfolio constraints or overlays like the ESG situation, but I'm not sure it's worth the cost to do it. Well, that, as I told you, Schwab has asked if we want to do that. They said it makes sense to do this and let us manage it for you. And I have a call with them on Wednesday where I told them I'm going to have this meeting first and get some direction about whether we want to do that. Or whether we want to leave it in their institutional money, our, our money market fund, or, or the treasury fund. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know what? One, I do think it makes sense to have a bifurcated investment policy, yeah. which is yeah. here's how investment managers are run, and here's how our whole, 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 whole portfolio allows us to, to do this kind of stuff. Um, but that's there. Um, that there are two other questions, which is. One, do we want to allow Schwab and or Fidelity to manage part of our portfolio? And two, do we want to continue to fund for long-term, not necessary funds 
for PFM and FRB, do we want to add to those as well? So, okay, so there's all right, so there's two questions. There's diversification yeah. of the whole fund, and then there's just, just not double dipping on fees. Um, right, and, and it could be a question about um, returns, right? So do our does the money market funds investment policy statement, is it more, is it, are we, would we, if we put a separate account together, would we be restricting them in some way or adding, you know, additive or negative in terms of what the policy is? So for example, supranationals, do they allow supranationals? Do we not, do we yes, no? So there might be certain types of instruments that are fine in the money market fund and work, or, do we want to, um, because the investment policy that we have laid out is really for the actively managed piece, the U.S. bank as custodian with the sub-advisors, PFM and FRB. The Schwab and the Fidelity piece are actively managed, and we can't, we don't have any say over how those are managed. Now, it may not be worth it, like it could cost us 100 grand a year to have a say and we don't get that much value for that. So that's what I would want to understand, Andy. Well, I mean, know how much value you get because I mean, theoretically, that's what you hire an invest manager for is to get value over and above what the fees are. You, you would ask them. Yeah. You would say, based on a more restrictive policy or a less restrictive policy, do you anticipate that you would have value or not? Like, what is this cost of 25 basis points or 50 basis points? And, you know, if the fees are two basis points for actively managed money market versus 10 basis points on 50 million, you can calculate it pretty quickly. Is it worth that amount of money for us to have them as direct accounts? I'm pretty open to both. So I'm, you know, I, I think those are the questions you ask and bring the data back to this committee and then we could have a, a way to make an informed decision. Sure. Carlos, do you have thoughts on that? Mm. And you're drinking mm. your mm. coffee over there. Mm. Mm. Okay, well, that's enough direction. Um, and I don't want to go over because we don't want to right now. We have. Um, yeah, go ahead. Anything else on that? Does that seem okay for anything? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just more information and in what the what the fees are and what the, the, what, the what the value yeah. that we're getting. Yeah, is. and I think Andy, what we want to come up with is what. So there, I think there's two levels to this, right? There's the actively managed security selection level, and then there's our level, which is the manager structure level, which is. You know, we really kind of got it divided up right now, like almost like 20 to 25 percent with each manager. Yeah. And is that what we're comfortable? If we want to set a range that we limit, no one manager. Well, that was my bullet number three is you want to give direction about specific amounts or balances in various yeah. institutions. So. Yeah. And, and I think um, if we have an idea of what kind of returns and like risks they're going to look at, maybe they can provide us some data on that. Historical data, we could see. among institutions, but then the institutions diversify themselves. Oh, yeah. right? So, I mean, we're, we're I mean, there's high, even if, even if 75% of our, our money was with Schwab, they would still, they would put it all in one fund or one, or they would, they would, they would create a portfolio. Well, right now they're putting it in one fund, but they could do it. Well, yes. <laughs> I mean, they're invested in. Right, right, but the right. fund is not just in one exactly. single year yeah. asset. Exactly. So there's, there's diversity, diversity in our policy among the managers, but then for the double dipping in fees, then we would have a policy where we basically contract with each of those managers to say, don't, just don't, don't double charge us for no more than 10% you know, within your meeting. There'd be two, that provision would be the contract we have with Schwab, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Our policy would say. Like maximum that you can hold in your own mutual fund yes. would be 10%. Right. Otherwise, you have to delete it. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. sorry I had okay, no I think it was hard we would do this. Start okay. Salisbury, um, I see is on uh, on Zoom. Um, Garth, uh, Garth is the CFO. You should unmute Garth so you can we can hear you. Um, the um, Garth is the CFO of uh, uh, MCE Marine Clean Energy. He's also been a leader, and I think he's the treasurer of the the. Um, the financing authority for prepayments um, and uh, 
at Rick Degolia's uh, uh, invitation, and I think he's also spoken with Donna as well. Um, he agreed to come here and provide an education to this group about what they do, what they've been doing, and how it works, and maybe answer any questions. He's got, uh, I think, a 45 minute maximum cutoff. Uh, I think our meeting ends at, at that point. Is that right? To start? Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah. If possible, I'd like to get done at you know, and certainly within forty-five minutes. Um, but yeah, hey, if it if it if we're so lucky that it's running longer because there's questions and otherwise, I'm happy to stay on a little bit. I just um, I can just so send send out a text and. Could so. we shoot for thirty, Garth? I think we have a hard, hard stop at ten at ten o'clock anyway. So let's shoot for okay. half an Absolutely. hour. A absolutely i will definitely keep it within that within the allotted time frame so no no issues there so it just just depends upon questions and so on so okay we have garth provided his uh document slides um and garth you just have to um give brianna the heads up to switch switch uh, slides as you as you want okay that's that sounds good so um well, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to say hello to Jan as well. I've known Jan for a very long time in different capacities. Hi, hey, Garrett. Yes. <laughs> you. Um, and um, I do appreciate um, your board chair, Rick, reaching out to me about this and 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 looking forward to the opportunity to talk to you a little bit today um, about prepayments. Um, and so I think I have I do have a deck. You can um, put it up there. Okay. So. Um, I'm not going to um, make it sound like I made up all these slides just for this. But this is based. This is basically the slides that I used at the Cal CCA conference, um, which is a which is a pretty good high level description of these transactions and what they mean, um, and what they can mean to to you as a CCA um, as you strive to kind of reduce costs. Um, okay, next slide. So I want to take uh, you know these. There's certain aspects of these transactions that are a little bit kind of eye popping, which is one, the size of the transactions, because, you know, there is tax exempt debt involved. Um, but I want to try to walk, walk you through this again at a high level um, and hopefully assuage any concerns you might have about this, this notion of, of, you know, very large amounts of tax exempt debt that are issued to facilitate the transaction. So prepay <laughs> prepayments have been around for a very long time, actually started in the 90s. <clears throat> where and really was uh, primarily around um, natural gas systems and you know on the on the, in the southeast and on the east coast and throughout the U.S. In addition to municipal electric systems, they have a lot. They have a lot of municipal gas systems, and so as these gas systems um, were um, attempting to secure gas for their um, for their customers, um, they started negotiating. Uh, contracts longer, you know. When I say longer, I mean five year or so contracts, five to ten year contracts, where they, where they said, "Hey, what if I paid you up front for this?" Um, so that was how these um, these prepayment deals uh, began. And in fact, those when a municipality municipal gas system would issue debt, it was their debt. It was recourse debt to them. So this wasn't the best um, credit structure uh, because they were oftentimes handing you know bond proceeds from their bonds over to um, over to lesser credits, quite frankly, um, you know, these gas suppliers. But so far, there's been about 137 prepayment transactions done, totaling over $77 billion. And again, as I mentioned, this was mostly to prepay for natural gas. <clears throat> it's estimated that these uh, have evolved into much longer term transactions, more like, you know, 30 years. Um, and um, estimated based upon previous savings that you know, over the, the life of these transactions, they'll save about $13 billion, you know, for, again, both gas now and electricity. And so I'm going to have to update this number because um, Clean Power Alliance just issued a $940 million issue through CCCFA. Um, so now we have about $6 billion that have been done on um, prepayments for CCAs for renewable electricity. Um, and um, these transactions will reduce the cost of your existing PPAs. And this is what's critical then. So you've already mm -hmm. signed these PPAs. Um, and this is a way you have a contracted price, whatever it is, if it's you know $30 for solar or $70 for wind or whatever it is, this transaction will reduce the cost of that PPA by eight to 12%. So that's why we do these things. 
That's why I'm, I um, helped in setting up a conduit, uh, the California Community Choice Financing Authority. And this entity is the issuer of the bonds. It's a conduit entity, much like many others that are set up in California. But this one will, is by CCAs for CCAs to facilitate these prepayment transactions. So next slide. Hey, Garb, uh, quick, yeah. Jeff Alistair, quick question. That yeah. reduced reduction in costs, is that just, is that basically like a time value of money? Is that just a, a net present value where you, you pay a certain amount up front and you, you pay less just because they're not waiting for their money? Or no, that, that is not the, that, yeah, that's, there. that's an excellent question, Jeff. That's not a, it's not an MPV number. It is a, it's an annual savings. So you think of it this way for the, don't want to get into too much of too many details, but let's say you had a, you had a contract, a win contract for 70 bucks. You did a prepayment. And then every year for the first, first initial term of that prepayment, you would reduce the cost, say, if it's 10%. You reduce that cost down to sixty-three dollars a megawatt hour. So it is. Yeah. It's an an. It's not a total NPV number. It's a. It's a sort of annual savings number based upon a reduction. And in can I? Hey, Garth, can I just um, to answer your question, Jeff, about where where's the savings coming from? Yeah. Um, it's because the the project were financed by tax taxable entities. We would be issuing our own debt as as uh, not as. No, but it's un, non-taxable, what's yeah, right? Yeah. Municipal, yeah. Okay. which is lower than, yeah. and, and there, and then we, the savings have passed along to us. Yeah, right. Got it, okay, thank you. Excuse me a second. When I'm down these thumbnails, I can't really manipulate my, my mute enough very well because I'm just a teeny little thing here. Um, so, um, so anyway, um, want to make sure that you know that it's um, you know this is uh, as Andy just indicated this this is about you know the ability of a CCA to issue tax exempt debt um, and hand all those tax exempt proceeds over to a taxable entity. Um, and so, you know, this is you know it's sometimes you know, consider it a dirty word, but this is arbitrage, pure and simple. But the fact is, it's an allowable arbitrage. So um, municipal utilities um, or CCAs who have, you know, can issue tax exempt debt can do prepayments and um, prepay for a supply of either gas or electricity. In this case, obviously, we're CCAs, and so we're, we're prepaying for renewable electricity. Um, and hand those, the proceeds of that tax exempt bond issue over to a taxable entity. Um, and that taxable entity takes that in as funding. And if they're normal, they're going out and borrowing money in the marketplace. And this is now pretty much done by banks, by the way. Um, the banks are the quote unquote prepaid suppliers. Um, and they take, they're, they're constantly in the market um, uh, issuing debt to fund their operations. And so um, they do so on a taxable basis. So this becomes funding for them. Um, and it's that differential between their funding cost and the ability and this tax exempt funding that creates the spread, the arbitrage that, that then is, creates the savings. So, I'm sorry, is that, was that a question? Sorry. Sorry. Keep going. Okay. Um, and again, these are these are okay. There there there's treasury regulations around this. The Energy Policy Act, and so um, literally. The 2005 Energy Policy Act was specific to, to natural gas, but effectively, this is, you know, these are absolutely legal and utilized all around the country. Uh, next slide. So um, we set up California Community Choice Financing Authority. Um, the original founding members um, really started out with four. CPA was kind of in the original discussions, and they joined later. So we have we have five founding members. These CCAs you see here. Um, and we have one associate me a member, Pioneer. And in order to do a transaction through CCCFA, it's like any other JPA, you would have to join. Um, we're really not looking for any more founding members who have a seat on the board, um, but also have to kind of work and donate time towards the organization. But you just you, you join as an associate member. Um, um, you then uh, pay fee. It's a, it's a $20,000 fee to do a prepayment. And then you share in the annual JPA operating expenses, which are minimum. We have no employees. Um, um, the founding members, um, you know, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at MCE, I'm the CFO there. 
Um, I, um, I kind of bill back my, my hours, if you will, to CCCFA. But to give you a sense, you know, for the whole operation, including our audit and everything else, last year, the cash call to members was $17,000. Um, so the more members we have, quite frankly, the lower that, that amount will go down. So you, you can see this is a very cost-effective way to, to do these transactions. And really, we formed this, this, this um, issuing entity, this conduit, specifically because the other conduits out there were, were charging egregious uh, amounts of money um, to, to do a transaction. So it was like $300,000 up front, up front, as opposed to $20,000 and $100,000 a year. So we said, that's ridiculous. We'll just create our own and, and do this. And it's worked out really well for us. Next slide. Um, so let's talk about these transactions for a second, because this is what really, you know, as a um, audit um, finance committee member, as a, a member of the board, you know, the, the, the amount of this, the size of these de deals are, are, you know, a little bit eye popping, but it's important to understand. So utilizing CCCFA, it reduces risk. One, you know, you are not obligated as the off taker of the PPA energy for the for the payment of the bonds. Okay, um, and utilizing the conduit, the bond is not a debt on your balance sheet. Um, it does not affect your credit rating, you know, nor debt capacity. And this is obviously extremely important. Again, these transactions are large. Um, you know, your obligation is just to continue to take the energy under the PPA, but to do so at a lower cost. Next slide. And Garth, can you make it clear who the CCA is actually paying since they're not paying for the, the bonds? Well, the, C, the um, it, it, you know, the, all of the cash flows go to a trustee. Um, and in fact, the, the PPA payments do go to pay the debt service, the prepaid suppliers paying for the energy, but the ultimate obligor is the prepaid supplier. So it's the bank. In fact, these bonds carry the rating, the absolute rating of the bank. So, you know, it, it's the best indication that the true obligor in this case is the bank. If, if this deal comes down for some reason, if the bonds have to be repaid, repaid early, um, it's the bank that has to cough up that funding um, and pay off the bonds. And that's very, very clear in all the documentation. Okay, next slide. So, so okay. if okay. you're looking at the questions, it is complicated. No, no I, I, it makes sense. It's just amazing. There's, yeah. a, there's a bunch of agreements. In fact, I think yeah. our, you said there were 85 agreements in one of the deals. Um, but there's agreements with the bank that you that will pay the bank. Um, the bank is making yeah. the debt payments. Um, the bank's taking it, you know, obviously a margin yeah. for the for, for doing this. Um, anyway, go ahead. Sorry, I don't mean to jump in. Yeah, here, no. So I, there, there's, I have I have some gra some graphics. We'll talk about this stuff. Is uh, you know, again, we want to kind of keep it within your time frame. But um, you know, um, so here we go. Here here's a basic um, sort of cash flow um, uh, picture of a transaction. Okay, um, and um, this is not the one I usually use. So let me just take a second and, and you know. So um, you have a um, CCA, like this. So um, normally you have electricity supplies. Let's look at the top, starting on the right hand side, right? You have a PPA um, counterparty. The electricity um, is flowing through um, the issuer. And what you will do is you'll do what's, on a, what's called a limited assignment agreement. You'll take your PPA, um, and now, by the way, all of our PPAs that the MCE signs and many of the uh, many other CCAs in the industry now, when they sign a PPA, it has this limited assignment language in it to facilitate prepayments. Um, uh, and more and more, these counterparties are recognizing what we're doing, um, and it becomes easier and easier over time. Um, but this is, you know, this is probably the biggest challenge: is to get your PPA counterparty to agree to this assignment. Once they realize it doesn't really affect them at all, um, doesn't affect the credit, in fact, maybe enhances the credit a little bit, um, but this is what you'll be doing. You'll be doing a limited assignment agreement, just assigning what's called for flash title, the electricity flowing through um, uh, the prepaid supplier in this case and the issuer, which is CCCFA, and then the electricity goes to you just as it always has before. Now we've put some entities in between. Um, and then you make payments to, to CCCFA 
Um, again, this all sort of happens on paper um, and at the trustee. Um, you do basically what you've always done, which you get, you get a PPA invoice, you validate that invoice and you pay it. Um, none of that changes. You, whatever interactions you had with the PPA seller, those continue as well the way they always have. I don't know if you have any sort of dispatch or other interactions or whatever you're doing with that PPA seller, all of that continues. Um, the, the, the prepaid supplier and CCCFA in the middle is just, we're passive. We have no interaction um, other than to be there to facilitate the tax aspects of the transaction. Um, the bonds are issued, the bond proceeds in, you know, in a split second at closing, go through CCCFA um, and um, go to, see the prepayment goes to the electricity supplier. Um, and again, uh, this is in the case of the prepaid supplier with the PPA you know, counterparty upstream from that. And so um, this is again, a simplified sort of look at the cash flows. Um, but the bottom line is, um, Everything continues to happen the way it always has. Um, and yeah, the transaction structures are, you know, I'm not going to suggest they're not complicated. They are complicated. But, you know, um, we've done a lot of these now. Um, they're pretty much pretty well baked. Um, you can maybe, maybe you want to tweak yours for whatever reasons, but, you know, these work. Um, and, um, you know, there's been a lot, a lot of work. It took us two years to get the first deal done. Um, but now these deals are coming pretty quickly and pretty, you know, and readily. Um, so all these negotiations, all of these aspects of the, of, of the very somewhat complicated structures have been worked out. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's now actually relatively straightforward, although somewhat time consuming to, to, to get a deal done. Okay. Next slide. Question. Oh, yeah, okay. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, just a quick question. Um, Garth, who's doing the who's um, banking these books? Holman, JP Morgan. Who's doing it? Who, who's Today? doing the deals? Yeah. So far, yeah. it's been J. It's been J. J it's sorry. It's been um, uh, Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs was the first one really to to um, approach us. Um, it was interesting. I was my second day on the job when I had the, we had the meeting with Goldman. Um, um, as Jan, which I'm, I'm an ex investment banker, I did these prepayment deals as a banker. And so I, you know, kind of understood them and how they worked. Um, and so it was obviously very supportive of trying to get these done, you know, for, I mean, uh, renewable electricity. So the primary, the primary players right now in the marketplace are Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. Those are the two banks that have done these transactions so far through CCCFA. There's another, a number of other, um, banks that are probably capable of doing them and are certainly pitching them to CCAs, which include Royal Bank of Canada um, and JP Morgan. Um, those are the, the entities that we're seeing um, sort of in the marketplace pitching and the Garth, transaction. Garth, what, do, what do you pay the, like, so obviously part of the cost of this whole deal is the investment banking fees and bankers fees. In Right. Yep. No, that's that's absolutely right. And I, and I do want to emphasize that the savings that we're talking about are net of all the fees. So, you know, the the arbitrage that's created um, pays all the, the the fees and ongoing whatever ongoing fees, and um, the um, um, and then all the save and then the savings are after that. So, I'll give you an example. So, when we when we did the the first deal, um, we passed a you know, um, um, a res or the board passed a resolution that allowed us to proceed as long as all of the upfront and issue and issuance costs were under one percent um, of the bond, you know, the amount of the bond proceeds. Okay, so um, right. They, they and are, who, they, go, go ahead. Who? Okay, got that. Who? Um, who is? Who are buying these muni, muni bonds? Who's who's taking them out, and what are the rates that you were charged? Like, what were the interest rates that they were going out? Uh, well, obviously they're yeah. higher today so, than they were last year, but um, so yeah, the, the the but it's a very good question. The the purchase of these bonds are overwhelmingly um, intermediate bond funds um, by like Fidelity um, uh, and Putnam. 
um, and and they come in for a huge amounts. Like they put in, you know, they they come in for like two hundred million dollars worth of bonds at a pop, um, mm -hmm. hundred million, fifty million. So um, they're they're very institutional because as a tax exempt bond, you know, they are effectively, you know, um, backed by. Uh, if you want to think of it this way, they're backed by corporate entities like banks. So they're not a big retail municipal product. They're very much an institutional product. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so they, and they are generally bought by these intermediate bond, tax exempt bond funds that buy bonds of, you know, between five and 10 years of maturity. So. And, um, and when you, when you were originally issuing and interest rates were lower, like a, you know, two, three, zero, two, zero, one, two, three, four percent. Now we're up closer to five. How, what is the, is that eight to 12 percent discount still holding on that because of um, the increasing interest rate that you have to pay off now? Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's kind of some, some fun and interesting. That was, was that um, Director Colson that was speaking? Sorry, I can't yeah, really yeah, see yeah. in the front. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, were, yeah. Um, uh, Yes, that's absolutely correct. But let's let's think for a second about um, clearly you've got some finance background. Um, so the um, this is all about the spread, right? So it's the spread between taxables and tax exempt. Um, taxables and taxes tax exempt generally trade somewhere around let's say you know ballpark at seventy percent of the taxable market. So it's a little counterintuitive, but the higher interest rates are, mm -hmm. the higher you know thirty percent. Differential between, you know, in a 2% environment is a lot less than 30% of a 6% environment. So in a higher interest rate environment, these, these, these bond issues actually, these prepays actually produce more savings than they than they would in a low interest rate environment. Um, for and as and as an example, for a long time during the very, very low interest rate environment, um, post um, the financial crisis, there weren't any deals getting done because there was no spread. To be had, right? So now we're seeing, um, you know, CPA did a deal a few months ago, um, Clean Power Lines, where they saved 13.5% savings. They just priced the deal last week where they saved 11.5%. So this higher rate environment is actually really advantageous for these transactions, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. Okay, no. keep, sorry. No, no, that's a good question. It's a good question. Uh, next slide. All right. So this is <laughs> this is where you know you might make your head spin a little bit, but let's you know because we we do it's said it's a structured financing, um, and let's look at you know what we have now. I mean, um, Municipal Clean Energy has a number of PPAs uh, signed with counterparties, um, and so. You are receiving energy, PCC1 energy. Um, you have the, your, your project um, counterparty, um, developer or otherwise owner um, through the PPA. They're sending you energy. You're sending them uh, payments of your, um, uh, you know, for those invoices every month um, and receiving PCC1 energy. With the prepayment, you introduce a, a number of different contracts and intermediaries, if you will, that intermediate this, this whole transaction. Um, and, uh, you know, this is all sort of set up. These documents are already have been sort of basically negotiated. They're, you know, they're, they're in many respects, they're off the shelf. Um, this is what took us basically two years to, to get to this point, to be able to get all this to, to work well with electricity. Gas is actually quite simple, natural gas compared to electricity, because you can, you can store glass readily. And I'm not talking about, you know, batteries now, but at the time, the whole idea of, of, having a certain amount of electricity flowing through in these PPAs and making sure that you have that minimum amount of electricity for the prepayment is what took you know, some, uh, you know, some negotiations around how to make these things work with electricity. But um, this, is what you, this is what it looks like once you do a transaction, you have this limited assignment agreement, which I spoke about where you assign certain aspects of your PPA um, to, um, through an electricity purchase and sale agreement in a master power supply agreement with the pre pre you know, CCCFA stands in between, you know, um, these the banks and you. We kind of stand in between as well, um, um, and we effectively become. You have a clean, a long term clean energy purchase contract with us, um, 
Again, this is all what's called flash title. It happens in a nanosecond. It's, it's really um, not anything you would even notice in, in your day-to-day -day business. But you know, from a, from a document standpoint, um, we stand in between the PPA seller and you. Um, and, but that clean energy purchase contract now is at a rate that is, again, whatever the savings are on the deal, eight, nine, 10% or more uh, lower cost on the, you know, on the energy that's delivered that's been prepaid. So what happens if something goes awry? Um, so you know, the, the bank um, has issues and goes away. Um, or um, some other some other issues mm -hmm. come up, then um, this whole thing unwinds. The bank is responsible for the bonds, and you go right back to where you were with your PPA counterparty, except it'll be at the original contract price. So, um, you know, wanted to talk to you about what it looks like before, what it looks like during the prepay, and what it looks like if um, the, the, the transaction comes down for some reason. And um, you kind of end up in the same place. All you've really lost is your loss, your loss of what we call the loss of bargain, the loss of those savings. You, you've also lost your uh, cost, your revenue fees, the banking fees. You, you got the cost to set the deal. Mm -hmm. I'm, um, I'm sorry. I, I'm, 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 it was breaking up. I didn't hear the question. So, well, so you would absorb also the cost that you incurred to set the deal up. Okay, no, um, that's well, that, 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 that is that that's yeah. all paid out of bond yeah. proceeds, right? Um, it's all paid out of bond proceeds, and yes, you would have lost your staff time dedicated to putting the deal together. And I'm not to suggest it's not going to be significant because it is. Um, but all all the costs, all of these these the the banks, the attorneys, the other entities that are involved in putting this transaction together all work on a contingency basis um, and get paid at closing from the bond proceeds. As I, as I mentioned, the prepaid supplier is responsible for the bonds. So if this deal comes down, those non-asset bonds, as they're known as, they're, that's the responsibility of the bank. So it's not the responsibility so, of the CCA. Do you, when, when you move from CCA to the, um, the CCCFA, so when those contracts go on, is each individual contract um, specific to a particular CCA or are they amalgamated or any way cross collateralized? So if somebody else's contract goes bad as the entity you're having to cover, how does that work? No. So um, every, um, you know, there was a, this, the, actually the second deal done um, was a, was, but was for East Bay um, and Silicon Valley. They went in together, did a deal. Um, those cash flows are very, they're distinct and specific. Um, so, you know, there's no sort of, um, out, uh, there's no cross collateralization or otherwise between, um, um, between PPAs with, within a, with a, for a certain CCA, or if you've done, if you've got multiple CCAs in a transaction, you know, all of those cash flows are distinct and, um, specific to that CCA. So um, again, you know, there, there are some economies of scale of doing a deal jointly with another CCA, but um, it's absolutely not necessary. And, um, and again, if, if you do do that, it's, it's all the, the cash flows are distinct. Um, and, um, and, and sort of, if you want to think of it this way, the bonds allocated for the prepayment are distinct as well. Um, they won't designate those within the bond issues specifically, but they, but they, they are from, uh, from a cash flow standpoint. And again, it's the prepaid supplier who was the same in the case of that deal that was done for East Bay and, Silic and um, Silicon Valley. Um, that bank, which was Morgan Stanley in that case, they're responsible for the bonds um, one way or another, regardless of which PPA um, was in place or not. So um, I think we can go to, a, if, if there's no other questions here, we can go, I think, to another slide. Because I've kind of- I have one quick question here. Sorry, yeah. Sean Marshall. So my question would be, um, what have other CCAs done to guard against a higher uh, PPA contract price to, you know, sort of, in, in their minds, mitigate the middleman and mitigate against potential real or perceived risk? So how are you guarding against a higher PPA amount if, if indeed this contract reverts back to the original PPA? How do you mitigate against that? 
Yeah, so have you, seen, have you seen evidence of that at all where the, the original PPA price would be higher to, because they're aware that there's sort of this, this middleman transaction happening here? Um, no, I mean, let me just say this, that, you know, the, the, these, these are existing PPAs that are already set up. Um, and, um, you know, as we have, as I said, we've done, now when we sign a PPA, we put in this assignment language in there um, and also give the PPA seller a heads up that it's very likely we're going to prepay this, um, which means very little to you, but, you know, we want, you know, just, you know, they, they are going to, um, we're seeing now that this has now become somewhat standard in, in the industry. So um, now I'm not gonna suggest that some of these PPA sellers have attempted to get some of the savings and we you know, they just have been told flat out, no, you can't, you can't get the savings. You're not going to get the savings. Um, and so, you know, it is, it's, it's, it's definitely been difficult with some of these PPA sellers. Um, but um, again, we're trying to uh, kind of change that mindset in the industry. Um, such that, you know, this is sort of standard now. You sign a PPA with a CCA, it has this assignment language, and you can pretty much assume that it's going to get prepaid. Um, and that doesn't mean anything to you. It just means that the CCA is going to be able to get some savings or reduce the cost. So um, that's really all I can say I, about it. You know, we haven't seen, we haven't seen, you know, what we have seen is with an existing PPA seller, their attempt to get some of the savings, but we've you know we've held really firm against that. We don't want to start that um, you know start set that precedent. Thank you. So that I, I will say, and I think it's a really good observation that was just made is that the market is the fundamentals of finance say that basically the market will get tighter and tighter and tighter with perfect information. Once this information comes out yes. and becomes more prevalent, we're going to see those spreads shrink significantly because you're going to have, I think the development John is saying, you're going to have folks who are putting their power on the market in projects saying, oh, well, I'm going to add three or four five percent because I don't want to have other kinds of back end as, 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 as developer, as a um, power. I mean, for us, if we have these, these the PDA is already in place. We can capture that because the numbers are fixed. But in the future, I think that's what you're saying, Sean. We yeah. may be pushed, you know, if, if it's, it's a natural pressure to yes. push all the potential. If yes. they know we have an right. yeah. you yeah. know, it's a, not necessarily that, but I know. Well, we certainly haven't seen, I mean, what we. What we've seen is such, you know, dramatic increases in, in costs for, for all kinds of energy and, you know, renewable energy as well. Um, um, you know, I, 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 I am not seeing any anecdotal evidence to suggest that, you know, that is because um, these PPA sellers are saying, oh, they're going to get savings on this anyway, so I'm going to be able to get a higher price. I mean, I presume you're going through, you know, your, um, your normal process to solicit uh, offers um, and, you know, those PPA sellers are gonna be, you know, without collusion, gonna be incentivized to, you know, get and, you know, get a project that you're gonna sign up for. So um, I can't speak to market um, behavior going forward, um, but, you know, we certainly haven't seen any evidence of this um, away from all the other factors that are, um, you know, pressuring um, and and driving costs up for for CCAs, you know, in the in the renewable energy space. So, um, but um, again, uh, you know, I think there's there certainly is at this point a you know um, a lot of competition um, around um, around projects and good projects. So, um, uh, presumably, hopefully, that will keep you know prices you know where they should be, and that. Prepays are not going to result in PPA prices going up. Um, you know, we've we, it's certainly not true in the gas market. It's not been where where almost everything is prepaid. It's not. It's still it's still a market. It's still an efficient market. Um, I would say that our PPA market is not an efficient market. But um, so um, we've got three more slides to get through in ten minutes. Um, why don't we go ahead and get through those, and then we'll all. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, have one, so I have one question on this slide, though, please. Yeah. So, um, Garth, there's a whole bunch of agreements here in the middle. These 
for our agreement. And I would just, I just want to confirm that it doesn't affect at all the operation of the project because you've now got all these other people in there, like yes. CCCFA, and because yes. We, we want to schedule the projects in a certain way uh, to meet our particular goals. And it looks like there might be the ability for someone else who now has their fingers in our projects to affect that. Right. And, and, and that's, that's extremely important. And we, and, and, but, you know, but it is absolutely um, true that nothing changes with your interactions with your PPA seller. Um, all of that um, happens just the way it always did. What what does change is is invoicing. Um, the invoicing, you know, you it come it it's it, it is it's it it's there's a, just an additional step involved with the um, with with invoicing. But all of your interactions with your PPA seller remain exactly the same. Whatever you're doing with them operationally, dispatch or otherwise, nothing changes. So and yeah, this is. The recs go directly into our Regis account and things like that. They don't go through the bank's account and then to us. Yeah, we worked on. I'm not the best person to uh, to address that, but you know, we've been very very careful. We went to the CPUC about this to make sure that you know this didn't query in any way. Um, you know, the long term contracting, the recs transfers, and otherwise. So. Um, um, Yes, we've had no issues, and none of these uh, projects where there's where there's been prepayments, are there any um, you know Rex issues um, with you know it being attached to the actual energy um, as it flows through you know these other contracts? Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, next slide. So here, this is just some language, um, and. You know, it's this is the language I was um, talking about that in, if that sh you know should should sh show up in your PPAs to give you this option, um, which effectively forces the PPA counterparty to um, allow you to do these assignments. Um, so we can just skip through this. Um, I want to take this. This is just a graphic to kind of depict what's going to happen. I mean, these are thirty-year transactions, and we do thirty years primarily because. We want to get the size up. We want to get this. We want, you know, the more bonds there are, the more opportunity there is to produce savings. Um, but you'll say, wait a minute, I don't sign a 30 year PPA. Um, and that, and the fact is, it doesn't matter. What you're prepaying is a certain amount of cash, like whether it's $30 million a year of renewables, um, whatever it is, um, you effectively commit to say, okay, I've got, let's just say I've got PPA, I've got four PPAs I'm putting in here. Um, and they're of different terms. Um, I just, I just say, okay, once that PPA is up and done, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, uh, put in another, another PPA with renewable energy, um, you know, out till we, till we get out the term. And then once, if that PPA goes beyond the term of the transaction, well then, you know, then that, that terminates the transactions over and then you're at the original contract price. So this is just a kind of a, uh, graphic depiction of how you would do it. In our deal, we put four PPAs in. Um, we're work, starting to work on our next deal. We're probably going to put five PPAs in, and there are varying varying terms, but that's how it would work. Okay, next slide. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how how you would do this, um, how you move forward with the transaction. Um, you do you do need to put together a team, um, and um, you know this. There are, there really are, uh, you know, there's some competition out there, but not a lot of competition in terms of the, the the firms that are really experienced in this. This is very much a niche part of the finance market within tax exempt world, um, and so you would need a municipal financial advisor. Um, there really only are one or two that that are really good at prepays. Um, you would need a prepay council, um, and um, you know, in this case, the prepay council. There's one, one, one person and one, one person that and one uh, law firm that's pretty much represented all the CCAs so far. Not that you would have to use that person, but he's really, you know, quite frankly, the best. You know, you need a conduit issuer, and we would um, hope and that you would use CCCFA for all the reasons we spoke about. Um, and then you need to select a prepaid supplier. Um, you know, which is the bank that would structure the deal. Um, bring in 
the uh, all the other deal entities that takes the funding and also um, markets and underwrites the bonds. Um, you also need to hire a trustee, um, um, get a rating agency involved, and then um, a, a bond and tax counsel as well um, to give uh, the, the tax and bond opinion. Um, uh, next slide. Oh, and by the way, most almost all of these entities, other than the rating agency, will work on a contingency basis. So if you start working on a deal, you engage all these um, professionals. Um, if for some reason that deal doesn't close, they don't get paid. Okay, so um, it's just the way it's kind of you know evolved over time with these prepayment transactions. Um, next slide. This is just a an example timeline. Um, I want to shout out to um, Clean Power Alliance. Um, they put this together. I couldn't get their logo off, the, off this off this slide. They put these last two slides together when we did the Cal CCA conference. But um, but this is a is sort of a for a first time um, uh, CCA doing a, pre a prepayment transaction. This is sort of the timeline of what it what it would look like. It would take it takes about a year, give or take. Um, to do a transaction, your first transaction. But I'll give you an example. CPA did their first transaction, I believe it was in March. Um, they turned around immediately, just dusted off the documents and did a second transaction. They priced last week and are closing this week. So it took them about two or three months to do their second transaction. Um, um, and they're gonna do more. Um, East Bay has done two transactions and they're working on their third. So um, this is kind of, um, Kind of what it looks like, and once you do one, um, it's going to quite quite a lot a lot easier to do your second one. So that's it. I'm you know not if there's any more questions or yeah questions anyone yeah Jeff yeah um, just as a thought experiment, if we wanted to get a little greedier and go beyond the prepayments into into getting that present value discounts. What would it take to create a deal where you actually bought the project itself as opposed to just prepaying? Well, then it wouldn't be a prepay and uh, you can't own the project outright and, and prepay it too. Um, that, that's, that, that's, uh, that is a tax issue. Um, the, um, so um, I know we too at MC are looking at, you know, project ownership um, and um you know, one of the, the analysis we do is like, hey, is it going to be cheaper to own this project? Issue, you know, issue tax exempt debt, for example, directly or put on our own equity. Um, yeah. How much are we going to save versus signing a PPA that we can then prepay? So that becomes the analysis, um, really. Um, and but you you can't own it and prepay it um, because likely if you're going to own it, you would issue tax exempt debt to do that. You wouldn't have to. But likely you would, and so you could. You can't issue more taxes than debt to prepay a project you already own. Yeah. But, but could CCCFA? I mean, hypothetically, could CCCFA issue bonds or put together a deal to issue bonds to buy a project separate, not as a prepayment deal? Um, we, uh, we 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 could we could. I don't know that we would. Um, you know, there's um. There is C, there's you know there's the there's the other um, CCA um, at CC Power that would probably be a yeah, better yeah. place to do that. We're really set up to do these prepayments, um, and we can do it. We can do it for municipal utilities as well. But again, it's prepayments as opposed to pure project ownership. Um, so that's that's the way this this JPA was set up. So um, we'd have to go in and amend our JPA. Um, uh, what was it to to actually issue debt directly? Okay. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> a couple of questions on transaction costs. I'm sorry. Is CC Power does not own any projects at this time and has not issued any debt. But I think the question is like, if we wanted to own the project, is it can we use CCCFA as a vehicle? To have the bonds issued through there and not show up basically yeah. on our financial statements. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because CC Power, those are all joint projects and this is slightly different. Yeah. So it's just really would CCCFA be used this way? Or a, or a comparable, 
another another entity set up to do the same thing with water ownership versus the thing. Because if we're owning them, we will be to be accountable to the bonds. To yes, it. that's that's correct. Yeah, it's on our balance sheet. Yeah, that has to sit on the balance sheet. Well, well that's just asking. Can, could it sit on there? It's set of a bank's balance sheet. Yeah, and, and we just yeah. You know, that's a longer conversation. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. It, yeah, it is. It is. We yeah. we certainly weren't thinking in terms of of play, uh, being that role. Um. You know, very much like so because. Words, yeah. So. I guess. What, I guess what the idea would be is rather than I mean, but if we were the if we were the purchaser or the developer, if we were the developer. We issue bonds directly. Mm -hmm. We would get the arbitrage because we get the municipal bonds rate, right? Yes. So why wouldn't we want those? Why wouldn't those? The bonds would need to be on the balance sheet. I don't know how we could exonerate ourselves from those. It's That's just, right. you know, yeah. then you look at the rating agencies and they look at their debt and then coverage. Yeah, it just makes it more complicated, yeah. right? But there is no, I, mean, I can imagine that somebody, somebody else is going to hold our debt on their balance sheet without us having, without being completely recourse to the project. I mean, uh, we could talk about it, but it just, it's like, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's it's time to help. It's just just really quickly. Earlier, you met. You referenced the one that was mentioned. Some costs. You know that that was the cost you mentioned. Uh, at what scale? Because clearly, smaller bond issuances will have higher transaction costs. So that one percent was at a billion dollars, at half a billion dollars. What was the what was the issuance? Yeah. Uh, what I'm sorry. What's what do you think is the average? Side that's of uh, the issuance, you do it. You, you, you talk about a one percent transaction cost, it's not a one percent transaction cost, it's only let's say if you do a, a, a one third the size of your uh, so, so what has been the size of the, the uh, deals that have a one percent transaction? Uh, the, the deal sizes have ranged from 500 million to 1.4 billion. The girl is significant, and then the other question is that it's just. In terms of assembling the prepayment deal team, you're not counting that cost in the transaction cost. That is on our side, correct? No, 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 no. The one percent cost, the one percent cost I, I mentioned was included yeah. all of so the all, all of those deal team members getting paid. So that's all it. Yeah. And, that's and, all. And, and that, yeah. And of course, it, it includes all of the, the profit that the yeah. uh, issuer and trustee and all the other folks make. Okay, and, and our next. As we wrap up, Garth, I'm going to go ahead and bring, bring it home with the final question, which is not, there's no free lunch everywhere, anywhere in finance in the world. Mm -hmm. Where are the risks associated with this? Like you, you know, you're saying, oh, these things can all go wrong and it just comes back to us. And this person who was sad and had to listen to pension obligation bonds, completely unrisky, um, currency lending, completely unrisky. I know there's risk in this deal. There's got to uh, be somewhere. You tell me okay, there's well, not, I'm not going to believe that it's a good deal. Uh, uh, what was the last part? Sorry. So if you tell me there's no risk in this deal, then I'm not going to believe you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I can I can tell you that the 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 risks are minimal. They're primarily reputational, um, and um, so the best example I have um, is that the Municipal Gas Authority of Georgia, which is the most prolific issuer of prepayment bonds in the country, um, did a prepayment deal with Lehman Brothers. Okay. Um, that, of course, Lehman went into bankruptcy. They def the effectively defaulted on those bonds. Um, Municipal Gas Authority of Georgia did not have to pay anything. Um, they had to pay um, their their attorneys to sort of defend them um, in that they were taken out of the bankruptcy and out of the proceeding. Um, and then uh, the trustee on the bond issues is the one that then pursued the um, the trust estate and the bankruptcy court to on behalf of bondholders because that's what the trustee does in this situation. So this is a real life example of an entity that you know had bonds outstanding. Um, it was about a five hundred million dollar deal, as I recall. Um, they you know the prepaid supplier, the bank um, in this case. Um, declared bankruptcy, 
um, bondholders got paid like 65 cents on the dollar. Um, and Municipal Gas Authority of Georgia spent something like fifty hundred thousand dollars um, in legal costs um, to get themselves out of the and it became clear that they were not not involved. So, um, you know, then they came around a few uh, however many minutes later and, and did another prepaid deal with another prepaid supplier. So, did they suffer some reputational risk? Yes. Um, but they were soon thereafter able to issue more bonds um, and do more prepays and have done many, many since. So um, it, the risk is primarily reputational. That if something, one of the counterparties or one of the, you know, one of these um, entities in the transaction um, ends up, um, and primarily the bank, who is effectively the guaranteeing the bonds, if you will, um, if they go, if they go under, uh, then that's that's problematic for the transaction. You lose your savings for sure. And there's the reputational risk that you have related to having been a part of a transaction um, that defaulted. But that's okay, the primary great. risk. Garth, thank you very much. Thank I know you. we ran over. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Garth, so much. We really right. appreciate it. Absolutely. Take care. All right. Take thank you, Garth. Bye. Um, go ahead and just We'll take, are we able to take the phone minutes to swap that up and then we'll go to Finney and Park and then wrap up. Dave, are you all right? Who's sharing the brick to volume? Rick, 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 I fully understand the structure. I mean, it, it looks like there are a bunch of these interim agreements that we need to look at. Um, yeah, I would, yeah, there is no free lunch, right? More back securities were free lunch, it didn't happen. Right? So I think that, it, but the fact that they've been in the market for 30 years, I want to know the comparability between the gaps piece, which is several, what is it, like 80, 90, $100 billion worth of transactions? And these only have six billion transactions. But I, you know, if they if they're comparable, uh, I, I would say the market's mature, right? And, but um, you know, let's let's see how those compare to the the electric compares to the gas. I guess I don't understand. I'm thinking of investment banker. Um, mm -hmm. It's like uh, you're pre-paying the supplier. What happens if the supplier disappears? So they wander there, they explode, or whatever happens if their investment is gone? You can already keep choosing. Well, keep in mind, you're paying the supplier to run the project. Yeah. And so as long as the project exists, mm -hmm. you know, somebody, if the, if, the, if the owner of a project were to go bankrupt, they would almost certainly sell that project to someone. So the, the, gen, the underlying generation sort of stays there unless, it, you know, it happens. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, it's all, we want to make sure we insure. Yeah, please. We insure, we insure. But it's a good, really good question. Thank you. I mean, I, I mean, the short answer to me in terms of the risk is that we, you know, in, in, in the, over the course of all those agreements, we basically pay a bank to take on that risk for the bonds themselves. So we forego some savings. If we, in a perfect world, we could insure everything ourselves, we'd say 15% versus 12% well, or 9%. We're paying some other trap parties to take on the risk, much of the risk. Yeah, you know, we also have to step that company, right? And yeah. These people we have to manage it, we have to monitor it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But even if it saves us 2%, it's still actually, I mean, it's still, that's still 2% of our, our, our savings. So it's sort of like this. The question is kind of how much of the savings get divvied up between us and the other parties. That sounds like, I mean, even, even paying those people to take risk for us, it's still 8 or 9% savings. It's still a lot of money. Yeah. 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 It's more than that. Okay. It's more than that because it's, it's roughly a twenty-five million dollars a year times thirty years, forty years. It's three half to three quarters. Yeah. So so ten percent savings is 
a lot of reason yeah. 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 yeah yeah i i think it's interesting and i i mean i would you know, be really interested in what it would take i haven't i've been wondering for years what it would take to buy some of these projects at yeah. a present value me, that so much right. so that becomes a big saving but it's just this and be paying the supply. No, we are not. We're not. So, so there's no net present value calculation on there. No. Right, right. No. It's just we because of the arbitrage, and it's an arbitrage. It is an arbitrage. Yeah. Right. Because of the arbitrage, right? The bank gets all this money. They take care of all that. It's, it's a reduced cost in the in, in the fund and in, 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 in the money we're paying. The savings is almost entirely due to the tax tax advantage of the oh, Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, look, I would call this classic rent seat. <laughs> that was, uh, yeah. And we wow. didn't we didn't look into this more earlier because you need to have a big spread between your between your taxable and your tax exempt and more interest rates and there wasn't any until like the last year. And as you can see, it's a lot of work to put it together. A lot of documents have to put together. A lot of lawyers, a lot of investment bankers. And then after seven years, you have to do it again. It's not a thirty-year term. It's a Every seven years, they want you to do this again because they need to get their teeth again. Right? Yeah, right. not to be yeah. cynical about it. No, no, no. You know, you're not going to be taxed by all those tax contacts. Yeah. yeah, and I'm gonna. I want to hear. I want to learn and understand it from that. I want to learn that. And well, we we have contacted Goldman who who has done this that we we know. Yeah, so, and they've come in. They pitched us. Morgan come in and pitched us. Well, you're coming like you know. I'm talking yes. to people in Morgan Stanley in this division. Yeah. And we're like. Fellow partners in the bank that yeah. understand, like, is this, you know, I, I just, just, I think the more you kind of understand that a little bit, because let me tell you, and I agree with you, Carl, I'm just a little, the reason I'm so jaded is because I got to hear potential obligation bonds were absolutely risk. Well, there are big risks in them, and it has to do with interest rates, exactly what we talked about. And then, same thing with, um, you know, security blending, which was like, I'll take all my security in my pension fund and I lend it to you. People were shorting them. It was collateralization, but the modernization wasn't an up to snuff. So, so when those so when those securities on the short side went, we're not able to, people couldn't purchase them back to rehand them back to you and portfolio and then cash in on the pool. My collateral was 95%. So now I've just taken a 5% loss. To earn two percent, and there is risk in these things. And no matter how many times people come in and say to you, "These are risk-free deals. These are risk-free deals. They're supposed risk," and we could include our staff being completely tied up on this, so they can't do a better deal for us on a PPA. I mean, if there's risk in all in the whole business. Well, the other thing that I didn't ask is, you know, he talks about eight ten percent, but is that variable over time? So, I mean, are you guaranteed? Is he guaranteeing? Do they guarantee that time? Well, when they issue the spread, that's where it would be at that point in time, right? So yeah. that's guaranteed. The only thing that I'm going to do is then that's the same. That's the same. It's perfect. And so it's because that after seven hours, yeah, you have to time the market to like, okay, we're going to go out this day because it's looking like the spread is yeah. X Tuesday. So yeah. we're going to go do it. We're going to issue it on Tuesday. So, but yeah. to, to Carlos's earlier point, yeah. this makes these deals make sense when you've got a billion dollars worth of transactions versus like the two. I'm like, why wouldn't it make sense at the beginning? But we were talking like three or four hundred million, but for like several billion dollars, mm -hmm. the, the frictional costs go down so much. So the right. negotiating agreement makes yeah. it makes well, now that's, now the industry's mature. That's why a couple of CCAs went in together. Yeah, well, that's well, why that's why it wasn't an option five years ago, but now. Think about it. Yeah. The, the other JPA that we're involved in, they're probably deals that they can combine yeah. deals that way. Could use. Yeah, and you've got a billion yeah. dollar commission for two billion, or like the wind turbine off of California. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Those kinds of things could mm -hmm. be, I agree, there's a kind of the scale question. Mm -hmm. Well, we can we can look at it some more, Jen. I think doing some more due diligence and then we can put it back on the stuff and we'll talk. Do you think? I said absolutely. We're doing that. Yeah. yeah. I, I think we have to have an uh, an answer of why we did or didn't, do it, but you know, or we have to understand it. Okay. All right. We're so, gonna... Andy and Jan, when this thing came to you and you guys said, "I don't know, looks pretty complicated," I think it makes sense. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was involved in one piece that at SVP, we did one for gas. And it was very because gas is so volatile to be locked in a price. And it was a really good deal for SVP. But here, you know, we it was on our list of things to do, but it wasn't on the top of the list. Well, and the industry wasn't there yet. Yeah. Yeah. There weren't yeah. enough deals that people didn't trust each other enough to in this sector to, to, to dump out the case. Yeah. In taking a year, in the beginning. It's a big, it's a big one. Okay, so we're just wrap it. We're just going to go ahead and remember to put nothing public comment. All right, no public comment. You no, know, any committee member report? Okay. All right, adjourn the meeting. Let's give you guys a couple minutes and we'll start in. Sometimes.